whether or not there's been a fundamental shift uh, in that architecture where the dynamics are such that you have less state control over these spaces, or have we transitioned into a space that is very much the same old, albeit with a different flavor? Uh, are the players different, or do we still have elite control of the media space? Uh, and, and then we try to interrogate uh, whether or not the, what we call the new guardians, who are uh, the new players in the media scape outside of the state, uh, in fact serving as a counterweight to the state, or whether they've been co-opted by the state uh, in ways that I think Raymond talked about earlier today. Um, you know, so we'll try to provide some evidence with regard to the regulatory bodies that are supposed to be uh, the ones that are stemming the state's inclination uh, to control. A look at what has happened with the neoliberal economy and what that has meant for the media scape. So now we have a lot of quote unquote private media organizations. Are those going to be counterweights or are they still going to be beholding uh, to the state? Does the state still wield enough power to leverage uh, its, you know, its um, um, you know, views, and, sorry, to leverage its power in order to impose its views on, on the media scape? And how is the new environment of what we call, uh, we call you know, the, the, the netizens in social media spaces um, serving as a counterweight? And so are there counter narratives or are these narratives in fact being constructed within a framework that is still shaped by those who control the levers of power? So that is the way we want to lay out. Uh, and the, the expectation here is that at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to share with you what we think should be a rethink of the notions of media capture because the traditional notion is that you've got uh, the state in, in Africa being able to control that media space and everybody is beholding to them. And so the state has a strong you know, capture of those media institutions. Uh, and we are arguing that it's probably a much more messy environment where you have, in fact, at this crossroads we're talking about, you still have the state having significant power, but that power has been dissipated in different ways that did not take away from the state's ability to still control. But nevertheless, there's a counterweight that is um, allowing for various contending forces to still be in this space of tension. You know, it's not really settled where the state is totally in control. On the other hand, the state is not removed from that control that it exercises because it leverages uh, its power in different ways. So that's the way we're laying out, um, you know, the paper. And, and we've tried to do this drawing on, you know, critical discourse analysis about Ghanaians operating in media spaces. We look at how media ownership has uh, transformed or not transformed uh, the whole notion of capture. And for folks who are not familiar with the concept, you know, it came from the 50s and 60s where economists were talking about how regulatory bodies, um, you know, became beholding to the people that they're supposed to regulate. And so, you know, um, when, and, and I think in the Ghanaian context, we've heard a lot about media capture or state capture, which means that you've got a group of people who have control over the apparatus of the state. In the same vein, when you're a regulatory body and you're supposed to be regulating others, uh, are you in fact able to do that? Or the, are the people who are being regulated in fact controlling the regulator? And, and I think in the global context, this came to the fore in 2008, when the whole um, global economic uh, you know, framework was thrown asunder because the people who were supposed to be controlling Wall Street were not doing their job and Wall Street you know, effectively was running uh, the show. So that has now been brought into the area of media studies where uh, the studies about do we engage in what we call favor exchanges where the people who control or who are supposed to be regulating the media um, or who are supposed to be regulating the state, and that will be the different arms of the state. So the media are supposed to be the fourth estate and therefore are able to um, hold governments accountable and so on. Are we finding them doing that work or have they been um, you know, incorporated into the, into the remit of the state in a way that stems their ability to do the work that they're supposed to do? And we will argue that if you look at the state, um, it still has a lot of control. You know, you look at, um, you know, its authority over, say, the national broadcaster, and it still pays the bills. 
uh, the broadcaster goes, to, the National Media Commission goes to the president and says, we can't pay our bills. Um, can you bail us out? That gives the state some leverage, right? It's whoever pays the piper calls the tune. So the state is still able to leverage its authority in ways that the NMC, which is supposed to be this arm's length independent body, is not able to. The N NMC itself, its operations are very much dependent on state largesse. And so they don't um, you know, sing the tune of the state. What does that mean? And so the, the, the classic example of that probably was when the Minister for Communications wanted to, uh, wanted the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation to seed its, uh, you know, um, the digital terrestrial platform uh, because the government said, you know, we, we don't want to pay for it. You cannot pay for it. Other people want it. But this is a national resource and the national broadcaster has a particular role. And so the minister just willing that and saying, take it away. And GBC was arguing that in this competitive media landscape, one of the things that we're able to do to sustain ourselves is the ability to compete. And we need this platform to do the work that we do. And so if we cannot, you're basically singing the death knell of GBC. And the minister insisted on going forward. And the question that a lot of observers were asking was that if this was to, as the minister said, to protect national security because we needed this uh, you know, asset to do that, then what happened in the previous months when you, you, you gave out this to private you know, entities? Wasn't it clear at that time that the state needed this for national security purposes? Or was there something else that was behind who got access to the digital platform and who did it? And, and, and the Media Foundation of West Africa has been fighting very hard to get information on who got allocated you know, uh, these resources at what point in time. And we know that in spite of the access to information act that we have in place, they're not willing to do that. And there was a ridiculous price put on this for the Media Foundation to get access, which from my perspective is you know, a stalling tactic not to share that kind of information. So the state still has that. What is good about it is that there was a lot of uproar from civil society organizations and so on. The government relented. The president asked the minister to suspend, not to stop it, but to suspend, which means that it could come back any time. So you see this contending forces where the state is trying to still exert its will, but you've got forces that are able to provide some counterpoise to that, but the state has not given up. I think another example, um, you know, going back to what Raymond said earlier today, has to do with the state still being able to use the security apparatus of the state, which has now been made up significantly by its acolytes, its supporters in different places, and journalists don't feel safe in Ghana. You have examples of, um, you know, journalists who, um, you know, have been attacked. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, the new technologies and everybody now has access to the, you know, to cell phones, you can take pictures and so on. And so you have a shift from the old order where you have all, like a panopticon where the state overlooks all of us. Now you have a synopticon or even an omnicon where people are able to see the state, right? So you're turning the gaze on the state and the state is not happy with that. And CTFM will tell you their example of their, you know, reporters who were arrested, beating up, and so on, uh, doing their job. Journalists are filled with a lot of trepidation. Uh, we know the worst has happened. Uh, the Amasule case is one that people refer to. And so the space is still very much controlled by the state because it has authority over the security apparatus. So those two examples, from, from our perspective, show that the state still has, you know, hold, it may not be as much of a stranglehold as is the case in other countries, but it's nevertheless still that. And then I'll end this session and hand it to Kwame by making the point that because in Ghana you have a hyper-partisan environment where there's still contending forces, and that we've seen, you know, unless the aid is broken, we see that we go through these oscillations. And so there are people who may not be supporters of the government, but are able to sustain themselves enough until the less cycle that brings their people back into power. And so that is allowing us to manage that. So we don't have in Ghana the typical case where the state is totally in control of that space. So with that, Kwame, I'll hand it over to you and you can share how um, the regulatory bodies are doing relative to, to that and also the market. So the market was supposed to solve the problem for us. Uh, has it indeed been able to solve that problem? So over to you. Right, so as uh, wisdom has you know, outline, the state has enormous power in terms of how it regulates the media. But um, in addition to that, the, there is a form of capture which is, which is important, and that is regulatory capture. 
and as you clearly indicated, the original meaning of capture, you know, comes from um, the condition where or Siglis uses that to describe a condition where the regulator then be, you know begins to behave like those are regulated. But there's another form of, of, of capture, and this form of capture is the effect of let's say politics and economics on the, the, the regulator. And if you look at the National Communication Authority, for example, which is one of our media regulators, a couple of things stand out. And one of them is the, the effect of political culture, uh, the political capture. I mean, if you take for a moment the fact that key players within the industry, within the National Communication Authority, are employed by the executive, the president that is. And if you look at the fact that the board of NCA, the board chair, for example, is also appointed by the president. And you, if, you, if you square that up with the fact that the National Communication Authority, its command and control is through the Minister of Communication, who is also a government appointee. If you look at that, that structure, what stands out is that you begin to understand why the public would interpret the NCA's effort to close down stations as being politically motivated. All right, and so Radio Gold, Radio XYZ, and all of that, they get closed now. And the official reason is that they needed to pay some dues. They were they, they were behind in their in their subscription. But people began to wonder. They will not be the only stations that that, that had defaulted. And why would you want to close them at a time that leads is leading to an election? I'm saying that we are saying that this kind of perception that it is politically motivated wouldn't have arisen if it wasn't for the kind of, you know, makeup, the way the, the regulator is set up, the way critical appointments are done, and the, its command and control structure all lend itself to this, you know, as, you know this belief, this perception that the, the regulator is, is captured. Of course, there's also the, the economic part of this capture. And as uh, Wisdom clearly in, indicated, if you, if you take the N NMC, for example, which is also another regulator, I mean, it gets its job done by relying on the on the consolidated fund. Okay, so the consolidated fund and who controls it, the mode of funding, becomes an effective tool of control. And um, if the media commission, which by constitution is supposed to uh, insulate the state-owned media from government interference, political interference, and also to, as it were, uh, foster or you know, let's say foster uh, uh, effective journalism. If this organization goes to the presidency and says that, you know what, can you bill GBC out with a 25 million bill out to pay its legacy debt? What, what exactly do you think is going to happen? Your job is to insulate it from state control, all right? And here you are, you go to the same, you know, authority against which you're supposed to be insulating the state, you know, media to say that pay the state media this amount. What does it mean? It creates trouble for, for, for you know, the, the relationship between the, the, the presidency or the executive, the regulator itself, and of course, the, the public broadcaster. But that is not the only thing. There are other forms of capture that you can, you can experience at the level of the market. And um, this is clear in, in the fact that, look, it's not only the regulator who gets captured the media entities themselves can also get captured. And so you find a situation where I was, I was amused and I was sharing a joke with, with, with Wisdom when Moment felt the need to acknowledge the advertisers and the sponsors when he was, he was here. And I said, yeah, the guy, there's no way you can, you can avoid them. It's important. Two minutes? Oh, okay, good. So the, the point I'm making is that the, the media institution can also be captured by, by the market. And what this does is that it imposes it, it constrains your capacity to be independent, okay? Media ownership is another form. And um, as Wisdom pointed out, in a, in a situation where the media political entities are parallel, and you can tell from the beginning where media institutions stand in terms of their political orientation, it becomes even easier for these kind of media entities to be controlled because access to state resources, advertising, sponsorship grants are also part part of the of, 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 of the carrot. So the next thing that I may want to see before I, 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 I give the this thing back to wisdom is the role of netizens in all of this. 
I mean, the communicative space has expanded. What is the role of the average person? If you don't function within a media establishment and you function on online, for example, what does that mean? Do you have the independence? Do you have the autonomy to have, you know, an independent voice? The data doesn't show that too much. It shows that, yes, of course, there are opportunities for people to be represented. The media landscape has expanded. But increasingly, you see that people are still mimicking official, official, the official dominant, dominant narrative. Although there are moments that you find that people are challenging dominant narratives, uh, people are deconstructing it. And if you take, for example, the fixed edition and the way people rallied around the internet as a rallying point to, as it were, push another narrative, all those things give us some kind of comfort that it is not all doom and gloom. There's a possibility that over time things might work out. But for now, the, the, the attempt to regulate and to control the state narrative it's, it's pretty, it's, 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 it's up and over. Where's what you conclude? Yeah, and I think, you know, because our time is up and we're just constrained because of where we are with, with the schedule. But I just want to make the point that in the Ghanaian context, let's not lose sight of the fact that you have media ownership very much intertwined with political right. ownership. Uh, and, and that just makes it obvious that the political class will control, continue to control this. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll leave it here and then, you know, hopefully we'll have opportunity to expand on some of this stuff over the course of the afternoon. Thank you. And um, this is a really uh, rich uh, paper that you, you shared with us. Um, but then it's online. Um, we're having some trouble with the Chinese, but then I'm going to stick to the item. And you sort of corroborate all the, 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 the issues that you mentioned. And if I recall correctly, sometime last year, you also did a presentation which looked at um, the, the way that the NC has changed the media licensing and really licensing and using that as a way to reshape the right. media landscape. So media actors are aware of these things and are trying, well, depending on which media actor you talk to, like,
for the young ones, particularly females, and then make recommendations as to what can be done to make the landscape better for both girls and boys. Now we all agree that ICTs are a thing now. It's in all sectors and it's enabling the economy to progress at the education level. We are all making good use of it. Even in the informal sector, we find ourselves um, making use of one technology or the other to promote whatever business or um, encounter that we have. But the reality is that many people are disadvantaged and are unable to access ICTs as it's supposed to be. It's a universal issue, but particularly in our part of the world, it's worse. And um, because we have fewer people having access the issue has been um, accounted for by way of saying that it is a factor of gender norms that culturally parents would not permit their young ladies to use ICTs for issues of saying that it will make them promiscuous, that house chores come before the use of ICTs. So at the end of the day, the, the females may have an interest in using the ICTs, but because the environment is not enabling enough, two things happen. They decide, okay, this is not my thing, or let the boys go and use it, and I'll probably learn from them or not at all. Because of this, the gap keeps widening, and it's not getting any better. Keeping in mind that ICTs have been employed in various sectors for more than two decades now, and it should be something that everybody, whatever age, wherever he or she finds herself, can use it. But unfortunately, it is not the case in Ghana, particularly in the rural parts of the world. Some factors that have accounted for this by research says that it is there are issues of ICT functionality, complexity, and the aesthetics. So that if I, the perceived usefulness is there, but perceived use is not established very well, then I'm not likely to use the tool. And this word is constantly widening the gap between male and female use of ICTs. There's also the idea of social cultural norms and discriminatory stereotypical role assignments. So that you go to some homes and between a boy and girl, it is more likely for a parent to give a tool to the boy than a girl. Irrespective of age in certain circumstances, the boy should have the knowledge first and probably teach the girl later. We ask ourselves, why should it be the other way around? Why can't the girl be the one to use the ICT first and probably teach the boy later? And that is also why we named the gap. The UNESCO had established that too many girls, too many girls are held back by a number of these biases and social norms, particularly in the areas of STEM and for our purpose as we focus on ICT. And constantly our females are being disadvantaged when it comes to having to navigate and use ICTs for purposes that advance them in whatever sector that they may find themselves, it's particularly coding. And it's been going on for, for a couple of years now. There are digital spaces, cyber labs, and so on. But then it was interesting to hear from these same policy makers and program officers that we are doing so much, but it's also highly inadequate. A whole year, and you train, say, 100 to 500 girls, and there is no long-term plan after April or after the session, you ask yourself, what happens next? What sustains their interest? What sustains their ability to go on? Their capacities that you have given to them. How are you sure that, say, in the next two or three years, you would go back and meet them the same? Unfortunately, there's no long-term plan and very little investment, as they recognize, is put into the area of ICT and so although something is done, it is not satisfying enough. Besides that, they also recognize that infrastructure deficit is one thing that is hurting us drastically. 
we can have, say, in a school, only one computer and, say, about 30 to 60 students are supposed to access it. We can imagine what would happen if, say, we enter the lab and there's only one computer. There's a likelihood that we find the male sitting behind it and the female behind them. So the male do it and let us see. You have, say, two hours or four hours maximum in the week to learn ICTs. What is the probability that a girl would get the chance to use an act, to use the tool within the week? Very low because per our interactions, you find a girl saying that, well, the guys are always rushing. The guys know it best, so we allow them to do it, and we never get to learn. But the fact that they do not have the chance to use these doesn't mean they don't have the interest. We go on the training camp and you see the girls aggressively going forward, answering questions, saying they want to try their hands on these things. And so if, say, the government invests a bit more into ICTs and say that we have more infrastructure, we make available a lot more, then the gap can be closed. That is the case on the policy landscape. Then we come to their homes. And that is where the issue too is a bit difficult to tackle. The girl has an interest, but the first point of socialization, which is the home, seems not to be enabling enough. The father says that house chores come before the use of ICT tools. So say that we come back from school at about 5 p.m. and we have till 8 p.m. to retire to bed. The girl is labored for, say, two hours after which she has to attend to her homework. And due to the fact that the parents say chores come before access to ICTs, again, the situation is not enabling. So that if, say, that in the near future, Governments invest a bit more in infrastructure, but the parents are not willing or do not accept the fact that my girl also is important, my girl must also access and use ICT. Then there's something that extra that needs to be done, a form of say community engagement for the parents to come to recognize that this is important for my girls as well in order to bring a balance between male and female access and of ICTs. This notion has come to stay with most of the girls we realize. So on the, during the survey, we ask the girls why you do a certain chore, and we ask the boys as well. And we have about 80% of the girls saying that I do this chore because it is a girl's job. And so if growing up I have in mind, my, it is my job to do a certain chore, and that is my place. That also, in a way, would end up challenging my interest. So that if at a younger age, research has shown that girls have more interest at a younger age, and if the environment is not enabling enough, as they grow, then the interest rate, if that is the case, then that means that there's still going to be a very big gap, and so we're unable to achieve what we seek to do. And having more girls say that, they have to do the chores. It's a reflection of what happens at home and the gap as well. And so they also say that, say, the most basic ICT tool that we can find in almost every home is a mobile phone. And before I can use the mobile phone, there's a condition to it that I need to complete certain chores before I can use a mobile phone. It's very problematic, especially in our world today when that is the way to go. That is what is enabling us. But unfortunately, things like social cultural norms, economy, the economy that we find ourselves in, infrastructure is not enabling enough, then constantly the gap keeps widening. And unfortunately, this is hurting the interests of the girls. It is not sustaining it. And it's about time that we invested a bit more into the training of our teachers, particularly, and also the young children that we have at various stages of education, so that as they progress, their interest will be sustained, and also there's more room for 
progressing within the field of ICTs. So we recommend a deliberate effort by government, a deliberate effort of investment, and also community engagement at the level of their parents that give them a chance because they can also do it so that we would have a balance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Greetings and salam. My name is Reginald Royston. I pre-recorded this talk from Madison, Wisconsin in the United States. And I apologize I cannot be with you all today for this important discussion on Ghana's tech futures. I've helped to organize this, these panels with Saram Avale with the support of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies. And breaking with convention, this discussion is almost entirely composed of Ghanaian scholars who are experts on technology and development in Ghana. I'm a diasporan and African-American and Afro Puerto Rican from the United States. I feel honored to be a part of this esteemed company. And I would also like to acknowledge the passing away of, uh, the passing away of an important black American Ghana scholar, Louis E. Wilson, over this past weekend. For over 10 years, I've looked at the relationship between digital media producers in Ghana's diaspora and tech entrepreneurs in the homeland. Thinking about homeland diaspora relations in Ghana in this digital era can help us unlock a vision of a truly Pan-African future. The concept of digital diaspora is central to my current book project, so some definitions are necessary. As I state in a recent article, Configuring Ghana's Diaspora, Digital diaspora represents both a virtual community and a community of ICT practice. It is not only the media of diaspora or online communities or websites such as Ghana Motion or Ghana Web, both of which are uh, uh, based abroad, headquartered abroad, but also the formal and informal tactics of Ghanaians in diaspora who are using digital medias. Ultimately, I would like to argue that digital diaspora is a technology in itself. Technology is often described as a means of overcoming problems, gaps, and failings. So what does the social and technical innovation of digital diaspora help us to overcome? Manuel Castells advanced the notion of the network society in the 1990s, and quickly the idea was taken up by utopian pundits and the public sphere uh, embracing the idea that the internet would flatten the world. This idealism is hardly borne out in statistics. The second largest continent, Africa, has the fewest digital connections to the external internet. Looking at this image provided by the mapping service Telegeography and the United Nations, we see that the continent has fewer physical cables than either Asia North America and Europe have to each other. Also, hyperscale cloud servers, the likes of which are, which are operated by Facebook, Amazon, or IBM, are few and far between on the continent. Most cloud servers that serve Africa are headquartered or based in Europe. Now, while Africa's mobile phone industry has become the most robust regional market in the world since the early 2000s, the comparative price of devices and the cost of data connections as a percentage of personal spending power remain highest for consumers in Africa. Ghana, however, has been a leader in African internet connectivity. It was amongst the first West African nations to obtain regular access to the internet in the 1990s, and, when, and it was an early leader in mobile telephony with firms such as Spacephone and Mobitel. At the height of telecom development in 2014, Ghana had six national providers of mobile internet access. And today, Ghana is a worldwide leader in mobile money and person-to-person -person electronic payment systems. Yet between homeland and diaspora, there's a disjunctive communication culture that constantly requires users to calibrate their connection strategies. If you look in this slide here, I have one column that describes the infrastructure of data connections for those living in the homeland in Ghana, and another 
for those living in diaspora in the West, primarily in the United States and Europe. So you can compare some of the downsides. For instance, uh, Ghanaians suffer from uh, intermittent access to electricity, which ultimately impacts internet access, lower bandwidth, and proprieta proprietary networks or walled gardens. Uh, some of the upsides of the Ghanaian internet system or the broad mobile broadband include uh, wireless-based internet access, a reliance and usage of SMS uh, as a, as a communications technique. Uh, Africa and Ghana in particular were amongst the leaders in WhatsApp adoption, in, in fact, forcing diasporans, those living abroad, to start using WhatsApp to connect back to home. And mobile devices, switching between mobile devices is relatively easy. In the diasporan uh, scenario, while there is robust bandwidth and free Wi-Fi in many places, um, connecting back home is a bit difficult with mobile devices. International calling fees are extremely exorbitant. In addition, the other affordances of being in diaspora, obviously with that high bandwidth, include a desktop-centric culture which promotes uh, prosumption or content production. So many theorists have utilized the concept of digital diaspora to describe the media of diasporas or virtual communities such as, let's say, Ochiami.net. <clears throat> in my field work since 2011 in the United States, in California, and in Europe, in the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam, and on the ground in Ghana, I've examined informal, community-based, and commercial attempts to bridge the technical and information gap between home and abroad. And this slide illustrates just a few things. Um, what you'll see is Jamila Abdullahi, who's a social entrepreneur, produces the blog Circumspect, for many years has been utilizing video technology to connect diasporans who are maybe experts in African development or who are active in African elections across the continent to each other and connecting Ghanaians who are based uh, in diaspora to the, the news and political developments that are happening back to home. So while let's say Google Plus wasn't necessarily intended as a diaspora homeland technology, it has been utilized and iterated in, in these kinds of ways. I also want to highlight some of the kind of informal practices. If you also see up there, what you see is the Magic Jack, which was an early voice over internet protocol device available to those who were not quite savvy with the internet in the mid-2000s. Uh, simply, the device could be plugged into a computer using a USB connection, and then a telephone cord could connect to that device. That telephone cord and the, the device itself allowed you to have a, a, either a US number or a number from Canada uh, that would allow those who are living in the homeland to have a number that those in diaspora could call, reducing the charges of international fees considerably. Now, obviously, you needed an internet connection to make that work, but again, this was a workaround uh, against the structures of the internet. I also have a picture of calling cards, and while that might seem a bit dated, calling cards are still used throughout the diaspora in the United States to connect back to home. Again, these are iterative technologies. We can also think about other practices um, and other platforms. I mentioned Ghana Web. Ghana Web continually designs and tools its platform uh, to be available and to work within the low bandwidth requirements in Ghana itself. Ghana Web is based in Amsterdam. It was started by a Dutch proprietor who is married to a Ghanaian woman. It is now uh, a conglomerate that has over presences in over five different African countries. Some other media, local media, uh, diaspora, productions that I'd like to highlight include some of the programming coming out of Salto, which is a community access, um, a community media company uh, publicly owned, in, again in Amsterdam, that offers a range of programming, including Adani TV and the Black Stars Radio uh, broadcast, which is broadcast again over the internet and entirely again in Ashanti Tree. So there are many examples of this. The last one I'd like to highlight quickly is the Progressive Mind Show, which is based in both Chicago and Atlanta. And Progressive Mind Show is hosted by Senna Aliko, who is 
uh, the host for who's been the host for the past five years, based in Chicago. And here in this this slide, we see images of representatives of both the NPP, NDC, and CODIO discussing the results and aftermath of the 2020 elections. This is a weekly program, and it is a very robust discussion, often about uh, trans Pan African ideas as well as diaspora homeland relationships. And we can see the connections and synergies between homeland and diaspora, again, are happening in real time with programs such as this. Permit me to narrate a unique experience from the field that for me demonstrates the potential of Ghana's digital diaspora serving as a global force. One of the most important events in digital diaspora I documented in 2020 is referred to as the Virtual Ghana Fest. In 2020, Chicago's Ghana Fest, the largest such Ghanaian homecoming festival in the United States, typically held in July, was made virtual due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Organizers of the event, the Ghanaian National Council of Chicago proposed, instead of a festival in the park, a live web-streamed affair hosting celebrities, musicians, and cultural presentations for the community. This transnational broadcast across Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and DTV, Diaspora, television, Diaspora News Television, an online channel based in Ghana, would feature performances and speakers in Chicago, as well as feeds from the homeland. In Chicago, the Ghanaian community numbers at least 30,000, and it is a mid-sized African immigrant community for the United States. Ghana Fest started in the 1980s at the Southside Washington Park. At its peak in the 1990s, it hosted over 10,000 attendees. American politicians, Ghanaian cabinet ministers, and MPs make regular visits. Visiting off and on since 2008, I've seen a beloved uh, storytellers, and I've seen dignitaries such as former presidential candidate Papa Kwesi Ndoum. 2020's virtual Ghana Fest was more of an online performance than a festival or family reunion. In my role as a virtual participant observer, I deployed over five screens to follow the events across social media. In addition to the actual footage of the event on YouTube, more than four hours, my research team screenshot more than 100 photos and interacted with more than a dozen people. On Facebook, there were ultimately more than 800 views of the event that day and 278 comments on its message board. A year later, the video had been viewed more than 8,000 times. On July 25th, 2020, the official feed started off with a pre-recorded montage of attendees dressed in daishikis and African tricolors, walking towards the ticket stand of Ghana Fest in years past. The shot fades to an image of an esteemed mother dressed in head wraps and beads, blowing a welcoming kiss to the camera, followed by fade-ins of Ghanaian cultural symbols the wooden staff of an Ochiami, a royal processional umbrella covered in adinkra symbols and porcupines, a derber of elders seated in formation around the parade square, elder black men and women wearing gold crowns, necklaces, and the rings of office, everyone draped in voluminous kente cloth stoles. The accompanying soundtrack to the video features a man singing out, you are welcome home, Akwaba, you've been kept down for much too long. Stand up, please, and say I am free. Don't forget, you are welcome home. Welcome home. The images pan over vendor stands, kenke and smoked fish, woven raffia baskets, and leather purses and sandals. Beads, soaps, and fashion cloths hang on racks. The slogan of the Ghana National Council of Chicago rises on the screen, beyond the year of return, building our community. The recording stops and a live feed from Chicago starts. A GNCC official begins to speak to an assembled crowd of 50 or so people at a discreet nightclub in Chicago that serves as the local soundstage. Welcome to a virtual screening of our Ghana Fest. We've had to do this because of the coronavirus. Today we have in stock for you a show not only from Chicago, but, for, but from 4,000 miles away, bringing you a cross-section of what Ghana's culture is all about. The MC Nana Marfo 
host of a local web show, acknowledges guests by name at the nightclub. He faces outward from the stage, but not necessarily into the camera. Ralph Reed, a production company, the local Chicago firm producing the feed, uses multiple cameramen, stage front, stage left, stage right, and close-ups of the band. Occasionally, the camera pans to the invited special guests, surgical masks dangling, dangling from faces and chins. The speakers and performers routinely work the live crowd while at times directly addressing the audience at home. Watching via YouTube or Facebook, the audience assumes the producers are actively monitoring the message boards. The enduring pandemic prompts a few cautions from people online. Please, social distance, please, you are too close together. God bless. Nana, please put up your mask. The event lasts four hours and includes a cooking class, a fashion show, and a gospel and high life performances from Ghana. The Accra portions seem pre-recorded, but the Takradi show seems live. The gospel singer Nasi finally appears, slowly grooving with the music's loping pulse. He speaks and sings in a combination of English and a country. I had a dream recently. The entire world was in sadness. Everyone was crying about Corona. Everyone was saying, Corona, hear me, Corona. Corona will be subdued. Ghana Fest, we have God. Therefore, we do not fear anything. At the end of the event, I participated in a Zoom-based dance party with DJ Bill Bonsu broadcasting from his home in suburban Chicago. The video feed showed the DJs spinning music from a laptop and turntables. If the YouTube comments evoked a degree of public address, digital orality, the simultaneity of the Zoom dance party was undeniable. Over 80 participants listened to Bonsu mix and blend African and American R&B, hip life songs, Afrobeats, and other popular music. Mothers and daughters captured selfie videos, while others danced at the screen, standing close to the cameras. One person had the video on while they worked an outdoor grill. Others simply broadcast their faces, absorbing it all from their backyard, smiling and in awe. I think we can celebrate Virtual Ghana Fest for many it would never substitute the joy and effervescence of being in a park celebrating Ghana with loved ones. But for the pandemic, it is a triumph, and for Ghana's digital diaspora, a representational triumph. However, as scholars, we must acknowledge not all diasporic representations and digital flows represent evenly. After all, technology is also described as an ambivalent tool, both good, bad, but also indifferent, as one famous description tells us. Questions arise when diasporic representations, such as in the web series An African City or Beyonce's Black is King, create incomplete images of the homeland, utilizing what I call a diasporic gaze. Further, we might also contest the detrimental flows of digital diaspora technologies in the case of Ablo Bleshi, the infamous e-way site in Accra, where impoverished young people from the north are often enticed to migrate to southern Ghana, working amid the digital refuse of recycling centers. Unfortunately, time permits just one provocation for further research, and I welcome your questions during Q&A. How can diaspora flows be both liberating tech and tech-savvy without being extractive? Thank you very much.